me tell you a story. In the beginning was the Word, who was with God and was God. And without him, nothing would have been made. There would be only darkness. Before God breathed life into man and woman to care for all that was created. Before there were the beasts of the field to roam the earth. Before creatures of the sea and creatures of the air. Before there were markers in the sky to guide our way. Before the dry ground and fields of wheat. Before the heavens separated from the earth. Before all things were created. There was only darkness. But God spoke. Let there be light. was born, sparing into the darkness, bringing comfort where there's fear, hope where there's dismay, life where there's death. light, this word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, so that every heart can have its new beginning. Thank you. Um, can we pray for Pastor Ryan as uh, he gives the message uh, this afternoon and also to our next-gen kids and our finances. Father God, uh, we thank you so much again, Lord, for this time, Lord God, for the opportunity to hear your word, O oh God, and even for our kids, Lord God, who are um, also hearing your word, O oh Lord, and learning about you downstairs, Lord God. We pray, Lord, that in their young minds, Lord God, you will just allow, Lord God, your word, Lord, to penetrate them, Lord God, and be, Lord God, the foundation in their lives, O oh Lord, as they grow up, Lord. We pray for all the volunteers, Lord, who are sacrificing their time so that they could, Lord God, teach these kids, Lord. Give them the wisdom, Lord, the patience, oh God, the joy, Father God, to be able, Lord God, to teach our kids, Lord, so that they will grow up knowing you, Lord, and loving you as well, oh Lord God. We also thank you, Lord, for all the blessings, Lord, that you have given us this year, Father God, that we can have the opportunity, Lord, to just give back to you, Lord. Thank you so much, Father God, for the faithfulness of everyone, Lord, and for your faithfulness, oh God. We pray, Father, for the for these finances, O oh God, that, Lord, this will just go a long way, Lord God, with your wisdom, Lord God, leading our leaders, O oh Father God, as they decide, Lord, on how to use this money, Lord Jesus. We pray, Father God, that you will just use, Lord God, this church, Lord, Father God, for the expansion of your kingdom here in New Zealand, O oh Lord. Thank you so much, Lord, and also for the word, Lord God, that you have given to Pastor Ryan, Lord. We pray, Father God, that um, everything that you have impressed in his heart, Lord God, he will be able to speak out today, Lord, with courage and, and clarity, Father God. Just override this preparation and let your spirit, Lord, just work through, Lord, each one of us and let your word, Lord God, just be shown, Lord, and be, be spoken, Lord God, and for the transformation of everyone here this afternoon, O oh Lord. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's welcome Pastor Ryan. Hey, hello. Merry Christmas. Can you hear me? Okay, I, I, saw, I, I see a lot of new faces, right? So can you just raise your hand again if you're here for the first time? We want to acknowledge you. Yeah, if we're here for the first time, we acknowledge you. We really, uh, are very happy to see new faces, all right? So it's good to have you here. And again, Merry Christmas! Okay, Merry Christmas, okay? So Merry Christmas, this group, Merry Christmas! This group, Merry Christmas! All right, wonderful, okay. So, do you know the person beside you on your left and on your right? Do you know them? 
Yeah? Do you know them? If you don't, you ask their name. Okay, ask their name. What's your name? <laughs> Okay, it's wonderful to see uh, new faces, and we are blessed to have you here. Okay, so do you know their names beside you? Yes. Can you still hear me? Okay, do you know the people beside you? Do you know their first name? Yes. Okay, do you know their last name? Yes. Okay, ask their last name. Ask their last name. Is it dying? Okay. Now, the reason I ask that is because... Okay. Thanks, Ken. All right. The reason I ask that is because um, I was doing a little research in the internet and I found very interesting last names. I don't even know if it's true. Okay, so can I show you some interesting names, okay? So for example, this, this little kid, no? His name is, the last name is Knight, and uh, his first name is, so his full name is Jed I. Knight. Okay, so very nice uh, last name, very interesting. Okay, how about this guy? Chris P. Bacon, okay? Chris P. Bacon, okay? So I don't know, I, I'm really not sure. Um, yeah, it looks like very real. Technical score advisor, Chris P. Bacon, okay? Now, uh, the next one, I'm not sure what the mother was thinking, but this is his name. Bezo Dudu Zupit Pop. Okay, so I wonder growing up, um, if the, in primary school, he was asked by the teacher, please spell your name, you know, before the exam. Maybe the exam is finished already, he's still writing his name. Okay. How about this one? Donald Duck. Okay, now I'm not really sure if that's true, but I saw it on the internet. Okay, how about this one? The marriage between two people, McDonald and Burger. McDonald Burger. Okay. Now, how about this dentist? Okay, this is. Will you go to this dentist? His name is Doctor Ken Hurt. Okay, Doctor Ken Hurt. So that is his. Uh, that is his name, and based on this uh, website, it is his real name. So Doctor Ken Hurt. Okay. Now, there's a meaning why I said these things, but let me just go to Luke chapter 2, verse 10 to 11 first. It says, But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Now, when we think of Jesus, we sometimes say Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ. But Christ is not a last name. All right, Christ is not a last name. In Greek, Christ means the chosen one, the anointed one. All right, when it comes, when it uh, for the Hebrew, it is translated as Messiah. So, the anointed one, the chosen one, the Messiah. Now, it says here in this verse, it is good news of great joy. What is, why is it great joy? Because it is something that brings a significant effect and it also bring, brings a long-lasting effect, right? So, did you receive gifts? Did you open some Christmas gifts this morning? Did you like them? Okay. Were there some gifts that you did not really like? You liked all of your gifts? So, do you still remember what gifts you got today? Okay, now if I ask you, okay, do you still remember all the gifts that you got last year? No, right? Maybe not, right? Because there's some gifts that are significant and some are uh, less important, right? But there are some gifts that are of utmost importance and it brings to you great joy. So for this, this is a gift that says, it says it brings great joy because it has a great effect and a long-lasting effect. Now it also says it is for all, it will be for all the people. So this gift was not just given to a specific few, it is offered to all. And it also says, today in the town of David, a savior has been born. So if there is a savior, then that means there's an implication that you're being saved from something. And for Jesus or for God to give something, all right, he, something as a savior that means it is important it is not something that you just take for granted 
So, the next, the last few months, we've been talking about Jesus, Jesus Unboxed, and we are now in John chapter 7. In Jesus Unboxed, this series, we discover Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, not just from hearsay, not just from tradition, right? Because sometimes we learn about Jesus based on simply what people tell us, especially our authorities, right? So, for example, I remember years ago, um, I stopped by a parking lot and I, have so, I had some food that I prepared to be able to give to some street children, right? So when I opened the door, you know, without any cue, so, uh, four street children already approached me and saying Merry Christmas, right? Expecting that I was going to give something. So I was about to give the food, and then I, but I first asked, before I give you this food, I asked them, do you know who Jesus is? Okay? So suddenly they were quiet. They were surprised that I asked them a question, right? So I asked, do you know who Jesus is? And then one brave kid answered, yes, he is Santa Claus. <laughs> right? Well, you know what? I don't blame them, right? Because sometimes we just hear it from television, from media, and for us, maybe from the authorities that were, uh, that were o over you. But what does the Bible say? Right? And as we unbox Jesus, Jesus is the gift. And the more we unbox it, the more we understand who Jesus is, the more we will appreciate the gift and the giver. All right? So that is why we are here in John, now in John chapter 7. Now let me read this verse. In John chapter 7, verse 40 to 43, it says, On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is the prophet. Others said, He is the Messiah. Still others asked, how can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? So they were reading scripture. Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. There were three groups of listeners during that time. Okay, all starting with the letter C. One is, there were some group, there was a group of listeners, they were the people who were convinced. They were convinced this was the Messiah. There was another group who was confused. They were not sure yet. They were seeking. But there's another group that was condemned. Because no matter what Jesus did, no matter what Jesus said, they, will, they already have their uh, presuppositions and they already believe what they would believe. It, they, nothing will change their beliefs. It just in a group like this, there will be some people who are convinced. There will be some people who are confu confused and there will be some people who will be condemned because no matter what the Bible says, you will stick to what you already believe in. That is why it is great to open the Word of God so that we can understand. The context of John chapter 7 is that for the longest time, because they read the scripture, they do read the scripture, they knew that one day the Messiah will come. Right? They knew it, that the Messiah will come. But they did not realize that the Messiah that they've been waiting for this whole time was right in front of them. For those who are believing, those who are believers, they are already waiting for the second coming. But you know what? There are still many people today who are still waiting for the first coming of the Messiah. That is true. Right? So for us, let's be careful. Because sometimes we would rather believe what was told us rather than what the Bible is telling us. Now, when it comes to Christmas, we also have to be careful because we, would, we might focus on what is Christmas or when is Christmas. Okay, Was Jesus really born December 25th? We're not really sure, right? Or sometimes we ask the question, how? What are the circumstances, the travel to Bethlehem, the virgin birth, the baby in a manger, the visit of the shepherds, the visit of the wise men? Knowing this information is good. Knowing the when, the where, how. But the most important question is to ask, why? Why did Jesus come? Answering this question will make you experience a very truly Merry Christmas. Okay, so are you ready? Okay, so can you tell the person beside you, Merry Christmas. Okay. So let us know the Christ of Christmas. Let me share to you prophecies mostly from the book of Isaiah and 700 years later 
it actually happened. Can you imagine prophecies written 700 years earlier and it happened exactly in the time of Jesus? So, let's start. First is the prophecy about the coming. Everyone say, the coming. Okay, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So that was Isaiah. Look at what happened 700 years later in the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 18. It says, This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but they came, before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. So it actually happened, this prophecy. Moving on to the verse 22 and 23, it says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So God revealed this plan of Christmas in the Old Testament through people and prophets. In the New Testament, he revealed himself by being a person. Up to that point, people just reached out to God and followed all the rituals and religion simply to appease God. Now, what does this imply now that Jesus came? Well, first, first major implication, because Jesus came, it means you can know him up close and personal. For a while, they thought God was someone who is distant. But now, because Jesus came in the flesh, you can know him person, up close and personal. If you want to know God more, study the life of Jesus. His words, his works, show who Jesus Christ is. Okay? His coming clearly showed that he wanted you to know him more. All right? Now, I still remember uh, many years ago when I was still courting Lay, my wife there, okay? I wanted to know her more. So she was already in Auckland while I was still in the Philippines, right? So because I wanted to know her more, you know, phone calls and Skype, it wasn't enough for me. Okay? I wanted to come. I wanted to see her in the flesh. All right? So I did not care. I finished up all my vacation leaves from the office just to travel here and I paid whatever amount. I did not care how much the plane ticket was because, yeah, that's true, that's true. Eh? I did not care how much the plane ticket was. I did not care how long the flight will be because I knew I will be with a person that I cared for, okay? Cared for and eventually really loved, okay? So, the, and being together, there's something different than just, you know, you know, do you get to know each other just via text? Is that gonna work? Okay, I don't think so. But there's something about really coming flesh to flesh, face to face, that you get to know people. And in the same way, Jesus Christ came, right? Because I was serious. I really wanted to know Lay, and I wanted Lay to know me. In the same way, Jesus was serious. God was serious. That's why he came. Because he wanted us to know him up close and personal. Another meaning of his coming is that you are assured that he knows what you are going through. Sometimes we think that God is just someone distant there. But when Jesus came, he showed that he cared. God isn't someone who is distant. You might think that God doesn't understand your emotions, what you're going through, your current situation right now, your strained relationships, or your financial crisis. But when we saw Jesus on the flesh, we can see that he had emotions as well. Did you know that Jesus cried? Did you know that Jesus also got angry? Jesus also got tired. So he had emotions. Jesus also experienced being betrayed. Jesus, Jesus experienced being wrongly accused, insulted, abandoned, and mocked. So if you experience these things as well, one way or the other, or perhaps in 2016, these are some of the things that you experienced it in your own personal life. 
because Jesus came, he, you can be assured that He knows how you're feeling. He knows what you are going through. He knows and feels your pain. I had my own emotions and experiences in, with these things, but I knew God came and He knew, I knew that He knows what I'm going through. Because Jesus came, you can also be assured that you no longer need to feel lonely. Because of His coming, you are no longer alone. Okay? Now for some of you, I know, you left your family in, the, in, you know, in different parts of the world. You are not complete as a family here. You miss your relatives. And sometimes it can get lonely, right? But can I assure you, if you have Christ in your heart, because Jesus came, you are never alone. You are always with Him. Okay? The question is, because now that Jesus came, how are you responding? Are you also trying to know Him? Do you know God more today than 12 months ago? Are you even trying? What's your plan to develop your relationship with God? If this is a great gift, if this is a good news of a great joy that is for all people, have you made that have you honestly made effort to know about this great gift? So tell yourself that you will not make any more excuses to meditate on God's Word. Have an intentional plan to know Him. Don't just hope that next year I will get to know God more. Make an intentional plan. Okay? So that is the coming. Okay? Can you tell your seatmate? The coming. Okay. The next is the healing. Everyone say the healing. Uh, let's look at the prophecy. In Isaiah chapter 35, verse 5 to 6. It says, Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of, of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. That was the prophecy in Isaiah. What happened during the time of Jesus? Jesus replied in Matthew 11, verse 4 to 5, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. That is what Jesus did. His ministry was one that ministered for the physical, emotional, and the spiritual. Okay? So, can you imagine... Okay, I'm gonna ask you. I'm gonna ask you to imagine. Okay, I want you to close your eyes. Close your eyes. Some of you, your eyes are already closed. That's fine. Okay, okay. But close your eyes. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Imagine living life with no sight for the rest of your life. Is that difficult? But you know what? Jesus came to heal even the blind. You can now open your eyes. Please, again, open your eyes. <laughs> okay, later, later. Okay, open your eyes. Okay, thank you. Walking blindly is difficult, right? But Jesus came to heal, not just physically, but emotionally as well. Those who were blind, they were not just suffering physically. I'm sure it was an emotional pain as well, right? Being blind, you will feel hurt. Okay? You, when someone says, oh, look at the rainbow. It's so colorful because you're blind. How can you, how can you appreciate beauty? Okay? If someone says, look, my, your wife is so beautiful. Uh, if I'm blind, I won't be able to see it, right? So I appreciate my sight a lot. <laughs> right? Every morning, I thank God for my sight. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? He gave hope to those who lost hope. Even the opponents of Jesus could not deny that the healings were happening. They just don't want to believe that Jesus is truly God. They refused to believe in spite of the evidence. Okay? Can I encourage you? Because of the healing of Jesus, you can be healed as well today. Okay? You can be healed in various ways. Jesus still heals you physically. Jesus can still heal you emotionally. Jesus can still heal you relationally. Jesus can still heal you 
personally. And Jesus can still heal you spiritually. In a fallen world, there will be so much hurt going on. And because we are in relationship with people who are imperfect, it is but inevitable that you will get hurt as well. It is inevitable. But those relationships can be healed as well. I praise God because as you share to me stories here around CCF, you have shared to me various stories of healing. I've, hear, I've heard stories this year of strained relationships being healed. I hear of, of spouses just getting back together because of healing of the Lord Jesus. I hear of rebellious children getting healed with their relationship with their parents. I hear people getting persecuted for their faith and yet God heals them emotionally. I hear stories of difficult bosses and yet you still, uh, you still work it out and you still persevere. I hear of healing from people who were stuck in the bondage of pornography, of vices, or even as simple as, you know, addiction to, to games. I heard healing and some of you, I hear that the healing is on its way. You are being healed at right now. With God's help, you are slowly but surely getting healed. Because Jesus provides the healing, you too can be healed today. Nothing is impossible with God. Because of the healing, you too can have hope today. Some of you, maybe you came to this room stressed, depressed, or a feeling of emptiness, or even at your age, you have already quit on life. Jesus heals and Jesus gives hope. Jesus came to give you healing and hope for today. Now, if I ask you a question, does God heal everybody? Does God deal, heal everybody? You know what? If you are a follower of Christ, all of us, you will be healed completely. Now, there will be some sicknesses that will end in death. But if you are a child of God, you will be healed completely because you will be given another glorious body in heaven. There will come a time, Jesus and the Lord promises, that he will wipe away every tear. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, and no more pain. That is his promise. So one day, if you come to Jesus, you will be healed completely. I praise God because for me, I experienced all kinds of different healings this year. I ask you, what kind of healing are you praying to the Lord for today? I encourage you, come to the Lord and be healed. Okay? So what's my first point? The coming, and this is the healing. Now, the third prophecy is about the rejection. Everyone say the rejection. In Isaiah, again, 53 verse 3, it says, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Some people followed, some people rejected, in spite of all his healings and all his teachings. Have you ever felt rejected? Okay, who among you here, you applied for a job and you were rejected? Okay, did you feel good about it? He's like, yes, I got rejected. Okay, okay. Now, who among you here, you pursued a woman and you got rejected? Oh. For those who got rejected, there is healing. <laughs> okay, don't worry. But you know what? It pains. It pains, right? It pains for Jesus to show and express all his love. He came all the way here to earth, and yet he still gets rejected by the very creation that he made. In Matthew 27, it was fulfilled, the rejection. Look at this, Matthew 27, verse 21 to 23. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor. 
Who did they choose? Barabbas, they answered. What shall, I, what shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Christ? Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Imagine the rejection. They chose a murderer, a well-known murderer, over an, in is over an innocent man who was giving them healing in all areas. Why? Because they saw Jesus as a threat to their religious beliefs and traditions at that time. In spite of all that Jesus has done, people, there will be still some people who will reject Christ. Rejection means and implies that people do make a choice. People make choices about who Christ is. You will still choose your beliefs and traditions. And for some, you will choose religion over Jesus. Because some people will say, I was born with these beliefs, I will die with these beliefs. And that's it. Okay? But, and some people, they will say, Jesus is a good person, but he is not God. Because that is what was taught to them in the past. So that's, it. that's a rejection. They will choose their own beliefs rather than choose Christ. Now, for some who are already Christ followers, it's possible that in a practical sense, you are still rejecting Christ. Every time you choose your own decision and you choose to sin, you are technically rejecting Christ. When you compromise because it, is, it gives you temporary pleasure, it gives you temporary gain, and you choose that temporal satisfaction, then you are rejecting Christ. Okay? So I pray that we stop rejecting Christ. Every sin, every disobedience is a rejection of Jesus. I ask you, how have you been rejecting Jesus the past years? It's possible that Jesus has been knocking on your door and convicting you of sin, and it's time for you to stop rejecting him. Today, receive Jesus instead of rejecting him. Okay? Next is what we call the intercession. Everyone say the intercession. In Isaiah 53 verse 12, it says, For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And that happened in Luke chapter 23 verse 34. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing, and they divided up his clothes by casting lots. You cannot pay for your sins, no matter how much good you do. Intercession implies that sin has its consequences. Even one sin has a consequence. In the Old Testament, it requires a perfect animal to be sacrificed, to be killed, in order for your sin to be covered. In the New Testament, it no longer required a perfect animal. It now required a perfect person. And the only perfect person that ever lived is Jesus. Intercession implies that God provides for you, for your need of an intercessor. Jesus intercedes on our behalf so that God's wrath is no longer upon us. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 5, it says, But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. The implication of intercession is this, and this is the practical sense. You no longer have to carry your guilt. Do you know many people today still live with a lot of guilt in their lives? They still live with a lot of regret, a lot of guilt. You still carry it until today. And because of that, you are not living the life that God fully wants for you because you are still carrying the hurts of the past. But God is saying, because Jesus Christ made intercession, He has already forgiven all your sins. 
if you have asked for his forgiveness and you no longer have to carry the guilt of your mistakes. You can be free today. You are no longer guilty. So stop carrying any kind of guilt that you might have in your life. Do we have regrets? I have regrets, but I no longer have to carry them because that is in the past and I know that God has forgiven me. Okay, so can you tell the person beside you, do not feel guilty anymore. <laughs> Some people ask, will Jesus really forgive me? I've been so bad. I have rejected him multiple times. I have made promises that I have broken myself and I have no one to blame but myself. Will Jesus still forgive me? The answer is a resounding yes. No longer do you have to carry the guilt because Jesus has made intercession for you. So stop thinking of the past, start thanking God for the present, and live with a beautiful future ahead of you. Amen and amen. After the intercession, there was also a prophecy on the suffering. Everyone say the suffering. In Isaiah 53 verse 7, it says, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. That was Isaiah. That was the prophecy. Think about it. And look at what happened in Matthew 27 verse 12 to 14. It says, When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Can you imagine? That was Jesus not saying anything, just as what Isaiah predicted 700 years beforehand. He knew that Pilate knew he was innocent. He was practically slaughtered. What does this mean? His suffering implies that it costs Jesus pain. It costs Jesus humiliation and physical death in order to save you. This gift that Jesus gave to us of eternal life is free but expensive at the same time. Okay? It's free. Now, for example, Okay. I think the most expensive gift I ever gave to my wife was the engagement ring. Okay? When I gave her an engagement ring. Now, when I gave her the engagement ring, okay, it's my gift to her. Correct? Now, did it cost the receiver anything? No, right? But did it cost me a lot? Yes. 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 Okay? So, the gift is free but it is also expensive. Do you understand? For the receiver, it was free because it was paid for already. But for the giver, it was expensive. In the same way, the gift of eternal life is now free for all of us to receive because someone paid for it already. And that is Jesus Christ. Okay, so don't take him for granted. This is an expensive gift. Now, how would I have felt? How would have I felt if I saw that this uh, engagement ring, you know, um, my wife won't wear it all the time, you know, you just put it there and when I'm vacuuming, I see that the engagement ring is on the carpet. Yeah, how would I feel? I would feel bad, right? Because that's expensive, right? It seems like it's not appreciated. Okay, I want an expensive gift to be appreciated in the same way. Jesus Christ is the most expensive gift. It is the precious blood of Christ that saved us from our sins. And yet, we still take him for granted. We only go to God when we need something. We suddenly start praying when we need something that is already beyond our control. That is taking God for granted, right? We only ask for prayer requests when someone is sick or when you are sick. That's the only time you really pray. 
it's possible that you are taking for granted the gift of God. So I encourage you, stop taking Jesus for granted. Pray more, care more, and share more this gift. I encourage you, ask yourself, how much time do you really spend with this gift? Or would you rather sleep and do other activities? Okay? I encourage you, be grateful for what God has done for you. Okay? Can you tell your seatmate, be grateful? Be grateful. Okay? So, let me summarize so far. Okay, what's the first point? Jesus, the coming, the healing, the rejection, the intercession, the suffering, and the last is the triumph. The triumph. In Isaiah 11 verse 10, it says, In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his place of rest will be glorious. So Jesse is the father of David. The ancestor is Jesus. There is no more suffering. All the glory. Jesus won. Jesus wins. So therefore, he now rests. Because everything that needs to be done is done. When Jesus was on the cross, Jesus, one of the last words of Jesus was, it is finished. He has done everything. He has already offered everything. So he is triumphant. Now in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2, this is, this is the fulfillment. In Hebrews 12 verse 2 it says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The fact that he sat down shows that it is finished. He no longer has to do anything, nor do you have to do anything anymore because everything has been provided for. All you have to do is to receive this gift and surrender your life to him. What does this triumph imply in our lives? First is, because Jesus is triumphant, you no longer have to look down at yourself. I think many people, even as Christ followers, you look down at yourself. You feel bad about all the circumstances. I encourage you, be grateful. Stop looking down at yourself because I've seen the last pages of the Bible. And when I've read the last pages of the Bible, I see that we have won. We are on the winning side. You don't have to feel defeated. Amen? Amen. And because Jesus is triumphant, you must trust that God has a great plan for you. Okay? For some of you, you are in the stage of waiting. Can I encourage you? You wait for God's perfect time because in the end, He is triumphant. Okay? God gives His best gifts in His perfect time. So you be willing to wait for His perfect time. Many of us, we want instant, correct? Everything is instant. But God is saying there are things that cannot be instant. Because every time, for example, when we pray and we ask everything and instantly God answers it, we might rather, we would appreciate more the gift rather than the giver. But when there is a waiting period, that waiting period allows God to work in your life and in your heart before He gives you the gifts that He wants to give you. You are triumphant even during waiting periods. And I, let, and I want to let you know as well, if you feel that there are times you are, you are feeling defeated, okay, you surrender to God. Because when God works, starts working in your life, He will be triumphant in the end. I was just imagining, probably in the cross, when Jesus died, Satan thought that he won. Satan thought that he was able to thwart God's great plan for humanity. Satan thought that he defeated Jesus Christ. Satan thought that he won. But you know what? Satan thought wrong. 
Because Jesus is triumphant in the same way. Stop thinking of wrong thoughts. You know, rebuke those thoughts that enter your mind that you are feeling defeated. Why? Because you can trust in God's great plan for your life and for the life to come. Amen? So, I encourage you. What is knowing the Christ of Christmas? Can you repeat after me? So what is first? The coming, the healing, the rejection, the intercession, the suffering, and the triumph. Know the Christ of Christmas. Are you willing to let God lead your life starting today? Can I tell you something? You can trust someone who did all of this for you. Hey, okay. I remember a story of a guy. His name is Bill Wilson. And this is not the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous because there's a, an, there's a founder named Bill Wilson also for Alcoholics Anonymous. But let me tell you his story. As a matter of fact, he, uh, Bill Wilson was able to meet with our founding pastor, senior past, our senior pastor, Pastor Peter, uh, a few years ago. Okay. A few days before Christmas Day, Bill Wilson and his mom was walking around in Florida. And in one street corner, the mom of Bill Wilson tells his son, okay, stay in that corner. And this is what the mom said. I can't take, I can't do this anymore. And he looked at his son, you wait here, I'll be back. But you know what? His mom never went back. So for the next few days, Bill was in that street corner alone. He was probably around the age of 14. Okay? Now, after three days, a man noticed him. He was a Christian mechanic. He was on his way to the hospital to visit his own son. And he saw that it seems like Bill was alone. So he gave him money, he had a few uh, a hot soup with him, and he encouraged Bill to attend a Christian youth camp. And in that youth camp, he learned about God. He learned about Jesus. And one time when the speaker asked, come forward those of you who would like to surrender their life to Christ, Bill Wilson came in front. And in that program, it was supposed to be that after, for all those who went in front, there will be a counselor who will talk to them, those who went in front. But everyone got a counselor except for Bill because no one wanted to approach Bill. You know why? Because all this time, he was still wearing the same clothes. Okay? No one wanted to talk to him. But he said, even if nobody will love me, Lord, you love me. After camp, after that retreat, that pastor invited him to stay in church. And he, the pastor gave him a closet that became his room for the next three years. A lady would just volunteer and give him one meal a day. And he would survive from donations. He was able to finish high school. And he started working. And another pastor encouraged him, why don't you go to Bible school and learn about the Lord? And in that Bible school, God gave him vision. God, God blessed him. And he started helping in Sunday school. After he graduated, he went back to Florida where he was abandoned by his mom almost on Christmas. And there he decided to start a Sunday school ministry. What he did was he got a bus, will go around every Sunday, and with the permission of parents, they would pick up children below 12 years old, and they would, he would bring all these children to church, and he would teach them Sunday school materials. Okay? And this ministry just kept on growing. And then God led him to go to Brooklyn in New York, where he, was, he felt the Lord assigning him to a very unsafe neighborhood. It just kept growing. 
Okay? So they had different buses. And now the churches did not have enough enough facilities for these children. So what they did was they came up, they made buses that can be transformed into a stage, right? So with so many volunteers, they would pick up children with the permission of parents, they would go to a park, they would go to a reserve, then open up the bus and have Sunday school there. They set up materials, they got volunteers, they had several buses all donated, okay? And this is what we call the Metro World Child Ministries. Today, Bill Wilson is leading the biggest Sunday school ministry in the world with an average attendance of 120,000 children every Sunday. Every Sunday. Can we praise God for that? And because he's in Brooklyn, New York, in a tough neighborhood, he's been shot. He's been stabbed. A lot of things have already happened to him. He's been, he has been beaten. He has been hospitalized. But he, until today, he still ministers in New York. Every year, he said to Pastor Peter, every year, even if he's in New York, he travels back to Miami and goes back to the place where he was abandoned and just reflects and thanks, thanks God for all that God has done to him and through him. That's why he appreciates Christmas. And in his talk with Pastor Peter, he said, and that's why I love children because someone blessed me when I was a child. That's the impact of the gospel. I praise God for all the people that blessed Bill Wilson. And now, Bill is blessing hundreds and thousands of children worldwide. For a while, here in CCF, we used the Metro curriculum for our kids. Okay? We would purchase these uh, materials and we would use it. Now it's different, but before, we were using the Metro curriculum of um, Bill Wilson. That is the power of the gospel. And I go back in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. This is the Christ of Christmas. The more you know this gift, the more you will appreciate it. A few things I encourage you today. Surrender your life to Christ. If this person did everything that he did, as promised 700 years ago, to that point, and he has done it all this time, and I've seen how God has done it in my, in my lifetime, he can do it in yours as well. I encourage you. For some of you here, it was not an accident that you're here. It's time to surrender your life to Christ. For some of you who already surrendered their life to Christ in the past, can I encourage you? Let this be the day you stop taking Him for granted. Starting today. I encourage you. Think of the Christ of Christmas. His coming, the healing, the rejection, the intercession, the suffering, and the triumph. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for being the Christ of Christmas. We praise you, O God, that you have done all this for us. Lord, we confess to you, Lord, the many times we have taken you for granted and that when we, we only come to you when we need you. But now, Lord, we pray that you, we renew our relationship with you. May we not take you for granted anymore. And for some of us here, this is your day. 
you haven't really thought about Christ, you've never fully surrendered your life to Christ, this is the day. So I encourage you right now, I want you to pray this prayer, a prayer of surrender. Mean it from your hearts. It's more than the words, it's about your heart. If you want to surrender your life to Christ, let this be the day. Say this prayer, Dear God, I admit that I am a sinner. I confess to you all my sins. Forgive me, Lord, for straying away. Forgive me, Lord, for rejecting you. Forgive me, Lord, for not even thinking about you. And now, Lord, I open the door of my heart. I ask you to come into my life. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. Lead my life beginning today in the same way that you have led the life of Bill Wilson. Lead my life beginning today. I surrender my life to you. I come before you, O oh God, right now. You are now my King. You are now my Savior. Lord, make me into the kind of person you want me to be. And Lord, I pray again for everyone in this room that as we reflect and think about this King of Kings coming down here on earth to do what He did to fulfill all the, prom the promises and the prophecies, it's just amazing. What an incredible King we have. And the more we understand this, all the more, Lord, we pray that we will really serve you with all that we have and all that we can for the glory of your name. Thank you, Father God. Let this be a new day for each and every one of us in this room. Lord, let this not just be one day, but let this be a stepping stone for us to know even more the Christ of Christmas. Thank you, Father God. And we are excited because in the end, you are triumphant and we are part of that triumph. And we give you back all the glory, honor, and praise. For we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.